The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Perseverance of the Saints. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We are daily reminded that thou art the God of all grace, for thou dost deal with us not according to our sins, but according to thy grace, and thou dost not reward us according to our iniquities. We bring thee our worship, and ask thee that thou shalt bless thy truth to us in this hour. Be with each listening heart, whatever the need, and do with thy word what only thou canst do. Take it, we pray thee, beyond the mere hearing of the ear, to the center of life and living, so that our lives may show forth by their righteousness in Christ the praise that belongs to thee. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text in Romans 8, 3 and 4 is that God condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteousness demanded by the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And we now come to the express statement that the Lord had a definite present purpose in sending Christ to die for us. There have been those who have accused Christianity of being an otherworldly religion. There can be no doubt of the fact that it does have a great deal to say about the next world. This is quite understandable when we realize that time is a brief breath and that eternity of a completely different essence will have the quality of unending life. Now our text today is not one that concerns the other world but the present world, our present life. Here we are face to face with our daily life and the way in which it is to be lived. Oh, there have been skeptics who have accused Christianity of offering mankind no more than pie in the sky by and by. But this is not so. The life that is given to us in the new birth is the life of eternity, which is to be lived in time here on this earth. Now, everything that is being taught in this epistle is leading on to the climax that will come in the last chapters, which will take us into all of the phases of life as it is to be lived today, whether in the factory or on the farm, in the city or in the town. The believer is presented here as being in the body, but it's clearly set forth that he does not need to walk after the flesh, the lusts of the body. Sure, we are, for better or for worse, living in bodies which bear the marks of the curse that came upon the race as a result of Adam's sin. We are, for better, not for worse, joined to the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that it is possible for us to grow in him and to know practical holiness. To this we must subscribe and cling even in the moments when the tides of the flesh seem to rise the highest. And when it appears to us that there are floods rising from our old nature, which seem strong enough to sweep away life itself, it is in moments like these that we often find the deepest riches of the grace of God and learn that it is possible for the Lord, through the provision which he has made, to fulfill in us the righteousness which is demanded by the law and which we do not have the power to fulfill by ourselves. When the angel announced the birth of Christ to the Virgin Mary, he said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now this is a promise for today. He did not come merely to save us in our sins, but to save us out of our sins. Thus it is that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ condemned sin in the flesh and provided the way whereby the righteousness demanded by the law might be fulfilled in us. All of this must be understood in the light of the previous chapters, and especially in the light of the conflict within the believer, which is recorded at the end of chapter 7. If we learn that perfect, unmixed good is impossible while we're in this life, how is it possible for the righteousness of the law to be fulfilled in us? We must not interpret the second verse of this eighth chapter as meaning that we have reached or can reach a state of sinless perfection while we are yet in these bodies. 
It is rather that God has removed us from the jurisdiction of the law of sin and death, even though that law still works in our members. We may perhaps illustrate this fact by an incident which took place some time ago at a point along the frontier between Russian jurisdiction and British jurisdiction in Germany. The British authorities arrested a man who had come through the Iron Curtain and held him for some infraction of a minor regulation. The Reds asked for the man, saying that he was an escaped murderer and that they wished to try him for his crime. The British knew that the mere surrender of the man would be the equivalent of his death, so they refused to give him up. Finally, he was allowed his freedom, and he went about according to his own desire, and all the while he was free from the sentence of death that had been passed upon him in the Russian jurisdiction. And thus we were, once under the jurisdiction of the law of sin and death. But when the Lord Jesus Christ was placed on the cross by the Father and put to death in accordance with the divine plan, God so joined us to our Lord in that death and in that resurrection which followed that he could righteously place us under the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's this which forever frees us from the jurisdiction of the law of sin and death. God himself cannot hold anything against the believer whom he has joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly he will never give us back to the enemy to be tried for that which the Lord Jesus died as the price of redemption. But even more than this, the existence of the law of sin and death in us, even after we have been joined to Christ, and after we have yielded ourselves to him for crucifixion death, this law cannot condemn us, nor can it nullify the work that we do for him, even with the imperfection of our palsied hands. We have been made free from that law of sin and death, and God himself will never bring us back under that law. Even though sin is within us, and death is within us, and even though they are operative, we are not bound by their law. And grace, thank God, grace reigns unto life through Jesus Christ. Our text now shows us that there is a righteousness demanded by the law. That this righteousness, which could never be fulfilled in a person under law, can now be fulfilled in the believer. And that this fulfillment takes place when the believer is walking after the spirit and not after the flesh. The righteousness demanded by the law is absolute perfection, as we've seen in earlier studies. A perfect God could never demand less than perfection. And all have sinned and come short of that glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. But God not only redeemed us from the curse of the law, dealing with the guilt of sin, but he also purposed to get at the problem of sin in the lives of the believer. It is a wonderful fact that the Lord Jesus Christ can come to dwell within bodies which are decaying, dying things. It's very important that we see the overall teaching of the epistle to the Romans with regard to these two works of Christ for the believer. If we understand this teaching, it will keep us from any of the false doctrines of the various schools of perfectionism which have arisen from time to time throughout the centuries. Specifically, we will not fall into the error of believing that there are two experiences in the Christian life, the first being justification and the second sanctification, the latter to be sought as a second work of grace. Rather, we will understand that he who hath begun a good work in us will keep on perfecting it until the day of Jesus Christ and that it is impossible for a justified person to be otherwise than indwelt by his Holy Spirit, and baptized of him into the body of Christ. One of the greatest theologians of modern times, Dr. B.B. B. Warfield of Princeton, has set forth the danger of this separation of the work of Christ into two works that are to be appropriated by separate acts of faith in his essay on the Higher Life Movement. Speaking of the work of Pearsall Smith and his wife Hannah Whitehall Smith, Dr. Warfield writes, the hinge on which their whole system turns is the separation of sanctification from justification as a distinct attainment in Christ. 
Sanctification is not thought of by them as involved in justification and necessarily issuing from it in the unfolding of the salvation received through faith in the all-sufficient Savior. It is thought of, on the contrary, as a wholly new acquisition sought and obtained by an entirely fresh act of faith. The fundamental fact of their religious experience was that they were dissatisfied with the results of their acceptance of Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, bearing their sins in his own body on the tree. They felt the imperative need of a fuller salvation than that exercise of faith had as yet brought them, and they were unwilling to await God's slow method of developing this fuller salvation through the conflicts of life. They supposed themselves to have obtained it at once by supplementing their first faith, through which they had received only justification, according to their system, by an additional faith, through which they now received, supposedly, sanctification. And this they proclaimed to be really God's appointed way for the sanctification of his children. Their whole gospel consists essentially, therefore, in the proclamation of what they speak of as sanctification by faith, by which they mean immediate sanctification by a special exercise of faith directed to that particular end. They imagine that thus they escape the necessity of awaiting the completion of salvation only in some future experience. Though it comes in two separate stages, it does not come, in their view, by process. Each of these stages is an immediate attainment following at once on the exercise of a faith particularly for its attainment. We're freed from the guilt of sin by one act of faith, they teach, and we are freed from the power of sin by another act of faith they teach. It is the immediacy of the effect which is the point of their chief insistence, and suspension of it on faith alone is only a means to that end. Now, all that we have been seeing in Romans is a contradiction of the idea of some second work of grace. Justification is a crisis. Sanctification is a process. Justification, we repeat, is the act of God whereby he declares an ungodly man to be perfect while he is still ungodly. Sanctification, on the contrary, is the necessary outworking of the indwelling life of the Holy Spirit in every individual who has been justified. This work in the inner life of the individual is one that is between the soul and God. We are unable to note the details of the conflict in anyone else. What may seem to us to be a sharp defeat in the life of some individual may be seen by God as a phase of a battle that is going to end in great triumph. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. And the working of the Lord in the heart of each individual is from a definite beginning to an assured end. Dr. Warfield has also pointed out that the expressions used by the theologians of perfectionism is often capable of a double interpretation, one true and the other false. We must be careful to distinguish between the two. He uses as his example two quotations from a German historian of the perfectionist movement. Theodore Yellinghaus, describing meetings addressed by Mrs. Smith in Oxford almost a century ago, said that the essential teaching of these meetings was that Jesus' blood, death, and resurrection has delivered and delivers us not only from the guilt of sin, but also from all the power of sin, according to the scriptures, that our sanctification comes not in parts through our efforts and self-mortification according to the law, but through surrendering trust in Christ's redemptive power and leading. These words, says Dr. Warfield, are capable of a good sense, as also are the words of his crisper statement, Jesus is for every believing Christian a present deliverer, who lets none sit and sigh in the bonds of sin. But this good sense is not the sense intended by the perfectionists. The sense intended by them is that those who have been justified by faith may attain sanctification also with equal immediacy by an equally simple exercise of faith.
This is a far cry from the true biblical doctrine of sanctification as being the entire work of Christ, continuing in us as what has been termed the perseverance of the saints. For the Bible teaches perseverance and not perfectionism. And our perseverance is described as a walk and as a walk which is after the spirit. We've passed the stage of birth. Regeneration is ours in Christ. We have passed the baby stage where we are alive but do not walk. We have reached the phase of Christian truth where we have laid hold of this new life and where we are exercising the power of that new life to walk in newness of life. We are born alive and moving and our walk is normal in the spirit and no longer abnormal in the flesh. It should be noted that all of this is a continual process of development that is begun by God and that is carried on by him. At the root of all the work that is done in us is an act that is seen by God alone. We are born again of the spirit and thus we become the child of God. God does that work in us and he knows that it is done long before we know that it has been done. Then there comes the time when we have consciously laid hold upon the word because we have been born of the Spirit. And this new birth of the Spirit and the Word gives us the consciousness that we are a child of God. And then there comes the time when with this new life which God has created within us and of which we have become conscious, we begin to manifest this life by walking in the Spirit. And it is in that walk that other men can recognize that we are a child of God. Much of the difficulty that arises among Christians in their concept of the Christian life comes from looking at themselves instead of looking at Christ. I recently had a conversation with a man that will illustrate this difficulty and perhaps suggest a cure for the situation. I was holding a week of meetings in a certain church and the pastor asked me if I would spend some time with a member of his church who could not get any assurance as to his salvation. I began by asking him if he thought that God was a liar. He immediately reacted as a true child of God must react and said that God was certainly not a liar. I then continued along the following line. Does God say that he loves you? Yes. Does God say that he gave his son to die for you? Yes. Is he a liar? No. Did Christ die for you? Yes. If you were killed in an accident, would you plead your own goodness as your right to enter heaven? No, I would plead nothing but the merits of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, God says that whosoever believeth what you have just said you believe shall not perish, but have six months life. He corrected me instantly. No, eternal life. Ten year life? No, said he, everlasting life. Well, is God a liar? No. Well, what kind of life has he given you? Eternal life. Well, when could you lose six months life? Well, after six months. When could you lose 10 year life? Well, after 10 years. When can you lose eternal life? Never, he said. And then the man replied, you know, I realize that the trouble has been that I've been looking at myself instead of at the promise of God. But the difficulty is that when I look at myself and at that point I broke in, I said, when you look at yourself, you're putting the struggle with sin over against the definite word of God. We must begin where God begins. Has he loved you and paid for your sins? Why, yes, of course. I see it now. Said the man, I am saved. I have eternal life. And then I continued. Now it is this fact of justification and the possession of eternal life that underlies sanctification. And sanctification will now grow out of this justification as surely as a tree grows out of a seed. The very fact that you have found a struggle within yourself is the proof of the presence of the life of the Spirit. A moment ago, I noted that you shuddered when you said that you had even doubted your salvation because you had looked at yourself instead of at the Word of God. Let me point out that you could never have shuddered at what you saw if you hadn't been looking with renewed eyes and seeing what you really were in yourself in the light of that which the word of God teaches. Then I went on to show that man 
that he had to avoid any of the pitfalls of those who sought to teach him that he now had to come to some second work of grace and to exercise a fresh work of faith in order to get a fresh work of grace. Oh, there will be some who will want to teach you that it now depends upon yourself, I told him, that if you have little faith, you'll walk in the flesh, that if you have some more faith, you'll walk more in the spirit and less in the flesh, and that if you have a great deal of faith, you'll be able to enter into a completely new experience and earn for yourself a freedom from sin. But do not be persuaded by any of these schools of false thinking. Grace is at work in your daily life as grace has brought you to salvation. And then I told him of those who attempted to exercise faith to obtain a second work of grace and who build up all sorts of human systems in order to demonstrate a supposed sanctification. Oh, we see them all round about us. Pale, sallow-faced women who have wiped the cosmetics from their lips, but not the gossip from their tongues. Men who proclaim that they don't go to the movies, but who stay home and see worse on television. Whole groups of people who pump up human effort, who paint on an artificial sanctification that is not the sanctification of God. For the true sanctification is that which will be a growth in the measure that the word of God takes effect in our lives. For every child of God born of the Spirit will grow in the Spirit and will walk in the Spirit. God is not a liar. You must understand that he is truth. It is he who has said that you are justified. It is he who has announced that you have life. You are aware that his life is within you. You are on the path. He says that he's working in you and he is not a liar. Therefore, you are walking in him, even though you may be taking steps that frighten you, like the first steps of a baby, may be a mixture of crying and laughing, of fear and triumph. But you, like the baby, will walk steadier as time goes on. And we shall see more of this in our next study. And we pray thee, our God and Father, that thou wilt bless the truth to each heart and use it to thine honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.